the name of Jesus Christ, good morning. Of course, we're blessed there by Elizabeth and Taylor and by Mrs. Schwen as well on accompaniment to open our worship service this morning. A couple of uh, quick announcements for you that you can see in the bulletin as well. If you would grab these red vinyl folders that are inside the seat pockets here and grab those and sign in and pass them along, register your tenants. We greatly appreciate knowing that you were here with us this morning. Also, in case you don't remember me, I'm Pastor Andy. I was here a few weeks ago. My family and I just got back from vacation. We camped all the way across northern U.S. and Canada, stayed for a week on the coast of Maine, right on the ocean front, and came back uh, camping all along the way with our boys. It was an incredible two weeks that we hope our boys will remember forever fondly because Kate and I knew it was just an incredible time of rest and relaxation. I know Pastor Vern has been busy here with you as well and did a great job caring for you all in the meantime, but I have to say I'm glad to be back home and glad to be back among you again. Well, today we're going to be kicking off a new sermon series, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes here. But I wanted to invite you, if you have suggestions for this sermon series, not all of the movies have been picked yet, if you have suggestions, be sure to send me an email or a note, and we'll see if we can't work them in before the end of August. With that said, I want to invite you to stand as Amy leads us in the call to worship from Jason Gray's song, Remind Me Who I Am. Let us stand. When I lose my way and forget my name, remind me who I am. In the mirror, all I see is who I don't want to be. Remind me who I am. When my heart is like a stone and I'm running far from home. Remind me who I am. Lord God, call to us now. Tell us once again. Who we are to you. Tell us once again that we belong to you. Please join us in our hymn of praise. Jesus 
Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please greet those around you this morning. Brittany's just going to share quick about just kind of the vision of CREW. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, CREW is a caring community passionate about connecting people to Jesus Christ. And um, our strategy has, there's three levels to our strategy, win, build, and send. And so win is just introducing students to Christ. And we do that through evangelism on campus, in the dorms, in the dining centers, um, in the student union. And... Um, Really, our goal is to give every student an opportunity to hear the gospel and to respond to it. And our second uh, level is build. And so uh, we're not interested in just making a bunch of converts. We want to make disciples. And so we um, equip and uh, train our students in their faith to grow um, through one-on-one -on -one discipleship, Bible studies, um, conferences and retreats throughout the year, and uh, plugging them into the local church. And then the last level of our strategy is send. Um, so after we win students to Christ and build them in their faith, we want to send them out. And we believe it is extremely strategic to reach college students with the gospel um, as they, we train them for four to five years while they're in school, and then we send them out and they scatter into all these different professions and all these different locations. Um, it's just a beautiful way to reach the world um, with the gospel through college students. And our goal with that is to um, equip students to um, take the gospel wherever they're going. Um, some people are called to go to hospitals, some are called to go to school, some are called to go overseas, but whatever that is, we want to equip them um, to, to be able to take the gospel wherever they're going. And so Grant has a really cool story about a student that he got to work with this year that just um, is a perfect example of going through that window to send. Uh, so yeah, the first couple of weeks um, of, of school, we really pushed to, to get crew kind of known by students. Um, and so one of the ways we do that is through, uh, we have like dinner line surveys um, just outside of the, uh, the dining centers. And so we, and especially freshmen, they flock to anything that is free. Um, and so we, if they fill out this survey, we'll give them a free uh, plastic cup. Um, and so I got a survey from a student named Cody. Um, I was able to meet up with him um, and he uh, has a, a blog online and he wrote uh, some stuff about our meeting throughout the year. And so I'll just read uh, his words. Um, he said, I was in Fargo for roughly one week before my life would change forever. I was hanging out in my dorm room one afternoon in August and got a phone call from an unknown number. It was God calling in the way. It was actually an intern from a Christian campus ministry called Crew. He asked if I had a little time and could meet up to talk with. Um, I went and met up with him, and we talked for an hour or so about God and my spiritual background. He took the time to carefully listen how I felt regarding my faith, and for the first time I actually felt like someone cared to know how I was feeling. At the end of our conversation, he asked if I wanted to pray for God to take control of my life and allow me to pursue a relationship with Jesus on an everyday basis. I prayed with him, and this, and this very moment in my life will change the way I live my life forever. 
Over the course of my freshman year at NDSU, I attended crew every Tuesday evening where we would pray and worship as a campus ministry. I also was involved in a Bible study in my dorm with a few other guys from the dorm. And over the course of the year, I was able to grow in my faith with these men. I was also able to attend two crew events um, over the year that further deepened my relationship with Christ. Um, and it was just a, a joy to meet up with Cody throughout the year and pour into him. And, and right now, he's actually in uh, North Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina, on a, a crew a summer project, it's called, where uh, he is with about 80 other college students uh, growing in community as well as just going out and sharing his faith on a daily basis. Um, and so, again, we just want to thank you as a church for your support of Brittany and I. Um, it, it truly is, again, a privilege to serve uh, through this ministry. Um, and God calls us to surrender our lives to him and, and his will. And for Brittany and I, that's serving with this um, ministry. We just feel like we um, are in a unique position in our lives where we can relate to college students well, uh, kind of know what they're going through and just uh, challenge them in that. So uh, thank you again. We'll be down in the fellowship hall with just some tools that we use um, uh, and just some more information. So please come down. Uh, we'd love to talk with you guys and share more about what God's, uh, how God's using us. So thank you. Let's thank you. I can't encourage you enough, actually, to, to take some time right after this worship service to go down to the fellowship hall. They've got pictures. They've got a great display there. They'd love to tell you a few more stories of uh, young adults that they're making a difference in their lives, helping folks get to know who Jesus is and going deeper in the discipleship. So I want to encourage you, after the service, stop down the fellowship hall, say hi to them, say thank you to them for their service. During this time, uh, we will have uh, our prayer time. During the 10 o'clock service, we do our prayers a little bit differently. Rather than having one person stand and pray on all of our behalf, we each get a chance to ask God to hear our prayer. And so God already knows our prayers before we speak them. You don't have to give any kind of lengthy description. Just a couple of words, a name, a situation. And I'll say, God, to your love, and the congregation will respond with, we trust this prayer. So I'll begin with, for the people of Palestine and Israel, God, to your love, we trust this prayer. The church staff. The church staff. God, to your love, we trust this prayer. Mark Hopewell, God, to your love, we trust this prayer. Cheryl and them, Polly, God, to your love. We trust this prayer. Daryl Van Beek. Daryl Van Beek. God to your love. We trust this prayer. Military overseas. Our military overseas. God to your love. We trust this prayer. Jordan Volkanat and his mom. Jordan Volkanat and his mom. God to your love. We trust this prayer. Louise Howell. God, to love, we trust yes, this prayer. Mary Warren. Mary Warren, God, to love, we trust this prayer. They have to arrange this week. A praise for the rain this week, God, to love, we trust this prayer. Chad and three boys. Chad and three boys and his three sons, God, to love, we trust this prayer. Steve Sitter, God to your love. Melissa Stefani and her baby, God to your love. We trust this prayer. Grant and Brittany, God to your love. We trust this prayer. Family and friends of Evelyn. Ken Canos, God to your love. For the people affected by the wildfires in eastern Washington, God to your love. For the people of Ukraine and Russia and West Africa. 
Africa, Sierra Leone, God is your love. Yes. Holy and awesome God, we know that you have heard the prayers that we have spoken out loud. We know that you have heard the prayers that we have printed on the page. And we know that you have heard the prayers that remain unspoken in our hearts. Give us the patience to wait for your timing for answered prayer. Give us the eyes and the ears to see and to hear the unexpected ways you will answer them first. <clears throat> Hear us now, O oh Lord, as we pray together with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
It is one that helps me to remember this. When we get to the chorus, there's an echo. I am the Lord your God. And as soon as I'm starting to say God, the echo is the same. For I am the Lord your God. Let's try that together. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. Excellent. And then there will be uh, a part where I say, For I am the Lord. And when I start to sing Lord, the echo for women or for whomever is, Do not fear. For I am the Do not fear. I am the Lord. Do not fear. Perfect. You're going to pick this up very quickly. Now, I thought 
it seemed only appropriate to begin at the beginning. And so this week we're going to look at Pixar's first released animated film, which is Toy Story. How many of you have seen Toy Story before? Let me see your hands. Excellent. For those of you who haven't, I'm going to give us a little recap. And even for those of us who have, because the film is almost 20 years old now, believe it or not, this movie was released in 1995. Let me give you a quick rundown. As the name implies, the movie is all about the secret lives of toys when people aren't around, when people aren't looking. And Woody, the main character, is a classic cowboy, soft, plush, stuffed doll, complete with pole string in his back. When was the last time you saw one of those toys that you pull the, str the string in order for it to talk? Tanner's looking at me like, I have never seen one of those except for that cartoon. Woody happens to be the favorite toy of a little boy named Annie. I mean, how can you not like the movie already? <laughs> and by default, Woody is the leader of all the other toys in Andy's room. And the story begins with Woody calling a, a town hall style meeting, rounding up all the other toys for a staff meeting in order to make sure that everyone is making adequate preparations because the family is moving, they're packing up and changing houses. And he wants to make sure everybody is prepared for that, but he also needs to sneak in the not so good news that Andy's dreaded birthday party, that event every year where any one of them might be replaced by a much cooler toy. He has to break the bad news that that day is today. So let's watch the clip. The move and they're fearful that they're not going to matter anymore, that they're going to be replaced. You know, there's a story very much like that in the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, we read about the Israelite people in exile. Now, before we go too far down this road, I feel like I need to clarify something, especially in light of present news and events. The people called Israel in the Bible is not the same as today's nation-state of Israel. Notice I pronounce those differently even to make a distinction. The nation-state of Israel today is only 65 years old. The people called Israel are thousands of years in the making. And while Jews inhabit Israel today, the nation-state, that political entity, should not be confused with God's chosen people, as told in the Bible. Now, the biblical story of the people Israel tells of the Babylonian captivity and exile over 2,600 years ago. The people of God, the people called Israel, had strayed far from their creator. They no longer honored the covenant. They worshipped other gods and idols, and they had become unfaithful. And first came the Assyrians. This was a mighty empire that subdued the Israelite people by force, but didn't destroy them. No, they saved that for the Babylonians who came 150 years later. And when the Babylonians came in, they laid waste to the place. They devastated and destroyed the Israelite people. They tore down the temple, which was hugely significant. Because for these ancient Jewish people, the temple was where God's presence on earth dwelt, what they called the Shekinah. Say that word with me. Shekinah. That was God's presence on earth. And so they believed with the temple destroyed that God was no longer accessible to them. But the devastation didn't end there. The Babylonians also rounded up as many of the Israelite leaders as they could, and they deported them, they exiled them. They made them move, spreading them out over the vastness of Babylon, separating them from one another. And this is important because, you see, for these ancient Jewish people, they needed three things to know who they were. To define their identity, they needed three things. They needed the temple, God's presence on earth, and the Babylonians destroyed the temple. It was gone. God was no longer accessible in their eyes. Second, they needed to be in the promised land. And they had been exiled to a foreign land with foreign-speaking people. 
If you've ever read Psalm 137, this is what the psalmist is lamenting. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept as we remembered our beloved home in Zion. We hung up our harps on the willows there as our tormentors, as our captors asked us to sing songs of mirth, songs of joy. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, he cries. And the third thing they needed, the third thing they needed was each other. You see, they identified with other people of faith. And yet, because of the exile, they were removed from one another. Three things they needed for their identity. The temple, the land, and the people, and all of it had been removed. They were people without a God, people without a home, people without family. People who had lost their identity. People who had forgotten who they were. And people who had forgotten whose they were. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever struggled like that at some period in your life? Felt like you were all alone? Felt like God was nowhere to be found in the midst of the mess of life? Nobody to lean on? No place to call home? Have you ever had this sense of not knowing who you are or what you're supposed to be doing in this life? I know in my own life, it's easy to get despondent about the things that I always dreamed I would do, but as I get older, it becomes more and more apparent there's not going to be enough time to do everything I wanted to do in this life. Even in my own extended family and circles of friends, I see people lamenting, people mourning because they don't know who they are. They had dreams for their lives, travel plans, career plans, Somehow, life happened. A job loss. Medical expenses. An unexpected child. Life somehow happens around us and to us, thwarting our plans and our dreams for ourselves. And we can easily be seduced into throwing a pity party for ourselves, wondering, what happened? Where did things go wrong? Asking ourselves, who am I anyway? In the movie, this happens as well. That birthday party that we were talking about, it happens, and Woody's worst nightmare comes true. And he gets a new toy whose name is Buzz Lightyear, Space Ranger. And Buzz quickly, quickly takes Woody's place as the favorite toy, which leaves Woody pretty despondent himself, despairing, dealing with his own issues of lost identity. And later on in the movie, Buzz goes through the same thing. He accidentally sees a television commercial, and he finds out he's not a space ranger after but he's just a toy like everybody's been telling him all along. And he too has his own identity crisis with quite the literal crash. Both of these characters had life happen to them. The unexpected befell them, and they found themselves in a place that they would never have imagined for themselves. They were expecting their demise at the hands of a destructive child. It feels feeling alone and without hope and abandoned. Let's watch that. Song. I can't help. I can't help anyone. I'm just a toy. I'm just a stupid little insignificant toy. Have you ever felt that way in life? You ever felt like Buzz, like you don't matter, like? You don't mean anything to anyone that you could just shrivel up and nobody would ever even notice. You ever felt like those ancient Israelite people in exile, all alone, like God was not there anymore? Insignificant? Life not turning out the way you hoped it would, that you just don't matter anymore? The prophet Isaiah 
and I'd say the prophet Woody have very similar things to say to Buzz Lightyear, to the ancient Israelites, to themselves, to you, to me. What he said, over in that house is a kid who thinks you are the greatest. And it's not because you're a space ranger, pal. It's because you're a toy. You are his toy. Isaiah declared, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine, says the Lord. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The floods will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you because I am the Holy One. And because you are honored. And because you are precious in my sight. And because I love you, says the Lord. God says you are mine. You see, my friends, our story today is the same as their story 2,600 years ago. It's the same story that John Lasseter brilliantly put on the screen. The paradox of life is that if we focus our identity on who we think we are, then we will always fall into crisis. We will always lose sight of ourselves. But if we identify ourselves first and foremost by the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, when we receive his grace, when we let him write his name upon our hearts instead of our boots, then we have that blessed assurance that no matter what floods or fires, no matter what exiles or storms or wars that happen in this world, God is with us. We are never alone, and God loves us. So the question I want to encourage you to ask yourself, this day and every day from here on out, is not, who am I? But rather, whose am I? And I promise, if you can root your identity first and foremost in the triune God, you will never be lost. And you will never be alone. To paraphrase Woody, over there is a God who thinks you are the greatest. And not because you're a farmer, or a teacher, or a cheesemaker, or a spouse, or a parent, but because you are his creation. Thanks be to God for loving us so much that he became one of us to show us the way, the truth, and the life. To show us who we are, and most importantly, to show us whose we are. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite you to pray with me as our worship leaders come back. Holy and awesome God, we know that you have called us by name. And we know that you have claimed us as your own. Lord God, give us your grace and your strength that we might turn our lives over to you, following you in all that we say and all that we do, from this day on and forevermore. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask you. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us in our closing song. Thank you.
sermon, but I assure you that's not the purpose of the lease next six weeks. If you'll remember a few weeks back, I preached about contextualizing the gospel, helping those who don't know Jesus Christ and using the present day culture to do so. My hope over the next six weeks is to give you tools to do that. Each of us here have family, have friends that do not yet know the risen Savior. And so my hope is that you can use these movie clips to help point the way to him. That you can help people understand who the God of salvation is by using popular media. So go from this place. Be intentional with the people that don't have a church home, that don't have a relationship with the risen Lord, and help them to understand how much God loves them. Help them to understand that God is calling them by name too and that God wants to redeem them. So fear not, for God is with you. God has called you by name, and you are his. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.